I'm going to ask that you will put your hands together for the best pastor this side of heaven and Africa. What? <laughs> Wakanda forever. Put your hands together for my pastor. I call him Rabbi William Coleman. Uh, <clears throat> as I said for the last couple of weeks, I uh, just want to make uh, give you a reminder. We're going to be, um, in the next couple of months, we're going to be restarting our uh, small group ministry here at the church. Um, our small group ministry, for those of you who don't know, is our at-home Bible studies. Um, and it is where we take a normal Bible study that a church would have, we decentralize it, and we place it in people's homes so that people can attend and get to know people that they worship with and study uh, without, uh, kind of at your own time. So uh, small groups will normally, uh, we've had them where they were from Monday through Friday. So at various times in various locations, saves on the gas, you can show up at someone's house that you worship with and uh, and study. And so what we're going to do uh, as a launch, <clears throat> we're going to launch our small groups uh, with a spiritual growth campaign. So right around the Easter time, we're going to do uh, what's called 40 days of prayer. All right. 40 days of prayer where we focus in on praying. I will say uh, a lot more about that next week, uh, but I just wanted to let you know uh, small groups are on the way. Um, and we're going to launch it with uh, a spiritual growth campaign called 40 Days of Prayer. Uh, Miss uh, Lakeisha will be in the foyer during the end of service to uh, sign people up if you're interested in being a host. Um, and so we'll have host training so no one has to be a host and not know what to do. But a host is simply someone that leads the Bible study. And so... Um, doesn't mean that you have to do a whole lot of teachings, but you do have to facilitate and we'll teach you how to do all of those things. Um, and so we're looking for, we already have uh, um, a few persons who have signed up to host, but we're, all, but we're looking for more groups in the areas of Richmond, Pinole and Hercules, uh, Oakland, Vallejo, and Fairfield. So if you're interested, if God is speaking to your heart, you want to be a host, get involved in a deeper way. Please see Miss Lakeisha at the end of service in the foyer. Amen. Okay. <laughs> Y'all all right this morning? Okay, here we go. Listen, let, let's warm it up. Turn to your neighbor and say, hey. hey. Good, morning. good morning. So good to see you. So see. Listen, I'm going to need a hug from you. And I'm going to need you to tell me something good about me. Come on, find two people and do that. Find two people and do that. All right. Amen. Amen. If you will, please join me in a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you. We bless your name. We honor you. Uh, we ask, Lord, that as we have come to lift up your name in praise, likewise, we have come to hear a word from you. And so at this moment, we ask that you would please open our hearts, our ears, our minds, our, heart, uh, uh, our souls, everything inside of us. Allow us to quiet out all of the cares that have bothered us up to this point so that we may focus and hear you clearly. Speak as you have never done before. Allow us to hear as we have never done before. And in the end, we give you all of the praise that is due unto your name. We thank you, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. And so we continue with our uh, series, Happy Church. There's a couple more weeks uh, left to this particular series. Hopefully, you're enjoying it and finding your happiness coming. Amen. Um, this will be, uh, I am blessed to be happy. I believe it's part four. 
um, and we're walking our way through the Beatitudes. Um, and so Jesus opens us up in Matthew chapter 5 uh, with a series of blesseds uh, or blessed. <clears throat> and as we read through it, uh, we'll hear this repetitive nature of all of them. So um, on your handout, we'll go ahead and just read through it. And it says, now when he saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them, saying, blessed are who? Why? Blessed are those who? Why? <clears throat> Blessed are the? Why? Blessed are those who hunger and thirst? Why? Blessed are the? Why? Blessed are the? Why? Blessed are the? Why? Blessed are the why? Verse 10, blessed are those who are, why? And verse 11, blessed are you altogether. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Amen. All right, so where we have been is we've started with blessed are the poor in spirit, and we have walked ourselves all the way down to the last two. And so last week we covered <clears throat> blessed are the merciful, and we, co and we covered blessed are the pure in heart. And so this week we're going to start at the, uh, the next one, which is the peacemakers. He says, Blessed are the peacemakers. Once again, uh, the word blessed in the Greek is the word makurios, and what it really means is happy. And so he says, happy, 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 happy are the peacemakers. Now, notice what he says in the rest of the verse on peacemakers. He says this, um, blessed are the peacemakers. Now, why does he say that? What, what, does, he say, what does he say about that? Blessed are the peacemakers, why? For they will be called the sons of God or the children of God. In other words, what, what Jesus is getting at is the identity of someone who is a child of God will always be recognized in someone who is a peacemaker. He says people will call you if you're a peacemaker, he says, Pe people will call you a child of God, a son of God, a daughter of God. Um, implication. Children of God are expected to be peacemakers. 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 How, how many of us know troublemakers? How many of us have been <laughs> the rest of y'all suffering from the sin of lying? That's what <laughs> And so, and so he said, he said, he, but he says, he says, happy, right? Happy are the peacemakers. Happy are the peacemakers. Um, so the question is, what's a peacemaker? What's a peacemaker? Um, write this down. This will help you. What's a peacemaker? A peacemaker is the person who seeks and is dedicated to the person who seeks and is dedicated to, listen carefully, the person who seeks and is dedicated to relational reconciliation. 
peacemakers. The person who seeks and is dedicated to relational reconciliation. Did you get that? One more time. The person who seeks and is dedicated to relational reconciliation. Do you have that? Are you sure you have that? Okay, here we go. What's a peacemaker? All right, here we go. Now, this is not, and I want you to understand this part. This is not pacification. A, a, a peace, right, a peacemaker doesn't seek pacification. Right? What is pacification? Pacification is, um, well, let me say it this way. Uh, peace is not the silent, listen, it is not the silence of commotion. Right? That's pacification. Pacification simply wants the commotion to stop. So a pacifist believes or thinks that peace exists when commotion is settled. That's right. And what ends up happening is we don't rock the boat as pacifists. Right? There's things that need to be said that we will never say. Because we think we have peace as long as no commotion exists. And for many of you who, who've been in relationships, you know that's not true. You, listen, you have, there's so many of us are in a cold war right now. <laughs> listen, straight cold war. Listen, like, like there's some people you haven't talked to, won't talk to, won't even look at. And there is tension in it so thick. But there's no, but if you, if we just observed you, it looks peaceful. I, I, I remember um, we went to, uh, 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 way back in the 80s, um, NWA comes out. Um, City of Compton, right? And they doing, listen, and they talking, you know, we, you know, we bucking folks down in the street and got my pistol and, you know, and all of this, right? And so I go to Los Angeles, and I just wanted to see South Central. Because to me, it's Beirut, right? And I'm like, this is a war zone. And we, listen, we get down to South Central, and we driving around, and it's palm trees, and the sun is out, and people walking dogs, and listen, and it's a nice place to be. So I get, so I'm with some friends of mine who live down there, and I'm down there, and I'm hanging around, just walking around, minding my own business, because I'm like, oh, well, that, I don't know what they're talking about in the song. This is cool. And my buddy who lives down there was like, hey, don't look over there. Hey, don't wear that. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Trust me, this is a war zone. It looks peaceful. It feels peaceful. Until you show up wearing the wrong thing. Or you walk down the wrong street. Because you, in L.A., right, and there's and parts of Richmond like that. You can, you can be walking down the street in one part, and everything is fine, and turn the corner, and you're in a whole different world. Anybody know what I'm talking about? See, and many of, we're like that. We're, we're, many of us have South Central kind of relationships. They look peaceful, but you say the wrong thing. Or head down the wrong road. And listen, it is a war there. And so people who are peacemakers, people who are peacemakers, they're not interested in pacification. So peace is not the silence of commotion. Listen, listen to what peace is. Peace is the healing of damaged emotions. It's the healing of damaged emotions. That takes a lot more effort and energy. And one of the things I've learned about this, Jesus says, Jesus says, happy are the peacemakers. Why? 
Number one, I've learned this, and you probably have learned it too. I have, there is no such thing as a happy troublemaker. I have never met a troublemaker that's happy. No such thing as a happy troublemaker. And so a peacemaker is a person who seeks and is dedicated to relational reconciliation. I need you to say this with me. Relational reconciliation. Relational reconciliation. It's about to get tough in a minute. Relational reconciliation. Relational reconciliation. Okay? Turn to your neighbor and look at him. Just look at him. And say, listen, you. Don't get on my last nerve. Don't get on my last nerve. I love you now. I don't know about five minutes from now. Okay, look at him one more time. Tell him this. Neighbor, I'm going to make you a promise. Whatever you do and whatever you say, I am dedicated to making sure that our relationship can be reconciled first before it's discarded. Y'all all right? Peacemakers are dedicated to and seek after relational reconciliation. Listen carefully. This is not and, I, and I, I know I'm repeating myself, but I can't say this enough because we're going to forget it as soon as we leave out of here. This is not about pacification. See, pacification, pacification believes that me ignoring you is peace. Pacification believes that me ignoring what you did is peace. Pacification is when I hope you don't say anything about what I just said or did. And if you don't say anything about what I said or did, it's all good. That, no, that's not, that's not what he's talking about. Let me tell you why that's not cool. Because when you're not cool with somebody, just because it's not commotion, you can't, you're not happy. Because you're always kind of walking on eggshells because you don't know where this person stands. Yes? Yes. Married people? Right? So, so, so this is not pacification. This is being committed to relational reconciliation. Now, the question becomes, how... How, what does that look like? What does that mean, right? What, is, what does that mean? Here we go. Peacemakers seek peace through two things. Two things. Two ways pe- uh, uh, peacemakers seek peace. Peacemakers seek peace through, uh, woo, tough. here we go, surrendering rights. Surrendering rights and taking up responsibilities. Peacemakers seek peace through surrendering rights and taking up responsibilities. Now, surrendering rights. Here we go. In conflict, in conflict, here's the reality to every conflict. Every conflict has the same reality. The reality is I'm right. That's the conflict. I'm right, right? See, see, think about it. If, if me and Prince have a conflict, what am I saying? I'm saying I'm right. What is he saying? I'm right. 
Conflict. To every single conflict you've ever had, it's because both persons are claiming their right. And no one is budging from the fact that they're right. Right? <laughs> right. See, if you, if you agree with me all the time, what's the conflict? There is none. Right? As long as you agree with me. But the moment you disagree with me, there's a conflict because you think you're right, I think I'm right. And the only way through that, the only way through that, listen, and what most of us do is in, what most of us do to deal with that is we pacify the situation, right? Which means this, I just, I just kind of not pay attention to you and you kind of not pay attention to me. We just agree we can't talk about that. And that's not being a peacemaker. And it doesn't make you happy. That's pacification. Watch this. Because, because in order to get through I'm right, you're right, one of us has to give up the right to be right. Are you with me? Uh, you missed it. In order for us to get past the conflict, the first thing that has to happen is I have to surrender my rights, which means this. I have to surrender my right to be right. And I have to surrender my right to be right to understand why you believe you're right. If I'm, if I'm not willing to understand why you believe you're right, I'll constantly think you're wrong. And then to a certain degree, I'll think you're stupid. And then once I think you're stupid, it elevates because I cannot help but treat you the way I feel about you. And it elevates because now, since you disagree with me with some stupid stuff that you are rattling off the top of your tongue, now all of a sudden I think either you stupid or you think I'm stupid if I'm going to believe that. So you calling me stupid with your ideas. Uh, <laughs> Anybody ever been there? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so what has to happen is I have to surrender my right to be right in order to understand why you believe you are right. Why is that important? Because I might be wrong. There's a revelation. <laughs> right? I, I, might be, I might be wrong. See, listen, if someone else's thoughts seem stupid to you immediately? Listen, you haven't thought about it deeply. You haven't. Let me tell you why. Because all of us in this room, we hear from our own context. There was, when I was working at uh, New United Motors, there was a guy, a um, Korean guy, uh, named uh, Yi. And me and me and Yee, we would work together, and, 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 and we were talking one day about, about marijuana. I don't know how we got on the subject. We were talking about marijuana. And Ye said, he says, hey, hey, Willie, Willie, Willie. He called me Willie. Hey, Willie, 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 Willie. I said, what's up? He said, hey, how much, how, how much, of, the weed, how much of the weed do you smoke? <laughs> and I said, I said, man, I don't smoke no weed. So he said, <laughs> Come on, Willie. I know you smoke at a weed. And so I said, No, I don't, I don't smoke. I don't, I, I don't smoke. He says, Willie, come on. All black people smoke at a weed. <laughs> right? Listen. And I could have gotten mad and claim racism. No. I had to step back and try, because I wanted to understand why do you think all black people smoke it a weed? I, want, I, I wanted to know. And, and by the time he explained to me why that was his reality, I listen, I disagreed with him 
but I understood how he got there. Are you with me? So that his thought didn't seem stupid to me anymore because I understood it from his context. Which meant that we could now have an intelligent discussion because I wasn't going to discount his thought immediately before I had even thought about it. Okay, see if we can get another one that hits home. Your president. If you're like me, you have yelled at your TV <laughs> a time or two or have said some stuff about this fella, and it's like, he's an idiot, right? That's like my common, he's an idiot, right? <laughs> like, you know, and like, and, and because, because, and I think, right, for, for just about, for most of us in this room, unless you're a Trump supporter, for most of us in the room, you're having a difficult time trying to understand how can this guy even be president how can this guy say what he says anybody ever okay now let, let me let me tell you what the issue is the is now for me I you know yeah most of us like oh this guy's an idiot oh this guy's stupid oh this guy listen but you can't discount his thoughts so quickly Why y'all looking at me like that? I'm not a Trump supporter. What I'm suggesting is you can't discount his thoughts so quickly. Let me tell you why. Millions of people voted for this guy. Whites and blacks. Rich and poor. Christian and non-Christian. And some of these same people in all of these categories are still supporting him. We think from our own context. I'm not saying agree with him. Please don't. But what I'm saying is, understand him. People say, oh, he's stupid. Eh, the man is president. He's not too stupid. Somehow, listen, somehow this fella has been able to do things that no other president in the history of presidency <laughs> could get away with. He ain't that stupid. Right? So my point is this. Now, we may disagree with him completely. But I need to understand why I disagree with you. And the issue is, if we would go back and simply understand who this guy is, what was the context he was raised up in? What was the economic status he was raised up in? In what part of the country was he raised in? What was his family dynamic? What did his parents tell him? What were the impactful events and the, and, the, and the tragic events in his life that makes him who he is? Because all of us have the same story, and that same story is why everybody in this room thinks the way they think. In, when, so in a lighter example, when me and my wife first got married, I grew up in a household where when you took your clothes off, you checked your pockets before you put them in the wash. When my wife didn't grow up in that household, she grew up in a household where when you took your clothes off, you checked your pockets when you pulled them off. And so we're doing the wash or my wife is doing the wash and then and then and I got money and all kind of stuff showing up in the wash. And so I say, hey, why don't you check the pockets before you put the clothes in the wash? And she said, well, why don't you check the pockets before you take your clothes off? And I'm like, because that ain't how it's supposed to work. The way it's supposed to work is you check the pockets before you put them in the wash. Anybody knows that. And she said, that don't even make no 
no sense. You, anybody knows that you shouldn't wear clothes twice. So if you take them off, then check the pockets before you put them in the dirty clothes because maybe the person washing the clothes don't have all the time in the world to check the pockets. And I said it only takes an extra five seconds to check a pocket. Are, are y'all with me? Look, here go country. She right, though. She right. She right. Conflict. Conflict. Listen. Are y'all with me? And so, and so, and so the person who was a peacemaker. See, now, now I know, you know, you know, y'all don't like me talking about the president like that because you sound like I'm supporting him. I'm not. I'm trying to help us in difficult circumstances be peacemakers even when we don't want to. Because it's easy to be a peacemaker when everything is going your way. What's hard is to be a peacemaker when you don't like the person you're looking at. But that's the only time it counts. You are known as a child of God. You are known as a peacemaker when every reason to slap somebody on the ground exists and you decide, recon you decide to reconcile instead of slapping somebody to the ground. Listen, that, that's why I kept having y'all repeat this because we think it's easy. This is not about, no, listen, this is not about pacification. This is not a lot about just getting along with people. No, no, no. This takes some time. I have to study you to understand you, to relate to you. And then once I understand you and relate to you now, so if me and Monique have a conflict, here's what I have to do. No matter what she says or how she says it, I need to listen and discover why she feels the way she feels, why she thinks the way she thinks, where does she come from, where do you get that idea from, why are you interpreting the circumstance this way? Then once I understand it, then I can relate to her and I can say, I see how you got there. I disagree with you, but I see how you got there. I see how it is you see, see it the way that you, at that point, and I've learned this, people don't always need to be agreed with, but people demand to be understood. You don't have to agree with me, but don't discount me before you hear me. Because if you discount me before you hear me, you have just said that my thoughts and me, we are stupid. And I, will, listen, and I will not tolerate somebody thinking I'm stupid. No, no. You may disagree with me, but don't just think I'm stupid but every time I say something. Oh, that don't make no sense. Well, listen, you out your mind. And you're about to have a bigger problem. And it comes from not being respective enough of somebody else to care about them and how they think and the way that they are. We Listen, we so much want things to go our way so quickly, we don't want to put in work. Being a peacemaker is work. But happy, though. Happy. Happy are folks who ain't got no issue with nobody because they've done the work of ironing out their issues. Had you ever noticed that the, peop the person that you feud with but reconcile with becomes your best friend? Have you noticed that? Have you noticed that sometimes the people that are closest to you are people that you feuded with a long time ago? Yeah, because happy are people who don't discount relationships before they reconcile them. Yes. Happy are the peacemakers. Y'all with me? Yes. Half y'all. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. Others. <laughs> okay, here we go. Here we go. All right, here we go. <clears throat> Last one. He says, blessed are the persecuted. Persecuted. What does that mean? 
Persecuted is the person who suffers for the right reasons. Persecuted. Person who suffers for the right reasons. Now, this one is interesting. This one is very interesting because watch what it says. Look at verse 10. It says this. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Verse 11. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. What's interesting about, well, one of the things interesting about this particular one is that the beatitude is actually in verse 10 and not verse 11. Even though he repeats blessed, the, be act the actual beatitude is in verse 10. Verse 11 is almost, it's, 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 it, it's kind of a compliment to verse 10. In other words, just saying verse 10 isn't enough. He, he added a whole separate commentary about what it looks like. No, notice, he says, verse 10, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That's the beatitude. Then he says, just so you can understand what that looks like, blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Ooh. Here's the second thing that's weird about this particular beatitude. Second thing that's a little, 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 little interesting, a little weird about it is because it's, it seems to be not like the rest of them. Why? Because the others are attitudes, listen carefully, that are sought. In other words, um, a person would seek to be poor in spirit or to be a mourner, or to have the attitude of meekness, or to hunger and thirst for righteousness, or to be merciful, or to be pure in heart, or to be a peacemaker, right? Those are attitudes that are sought. But this one, he says, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. In other words, I'm not looking to be persecuted. That's not, that's not what I'm looking to be. So it, it, it seems to be different because all of the others are things that we try to do. They're attitudes we try to have. This one, though, is not about an attitude that we try to have. He just says, happy are people who are persecuted for righteousness. And it's weird because um, it's almost like he's saying, happy are those who are persecuted But happy and persecuted don't go together. It's like he's saying, when you're persecuted, happiness comes. Ah. It's not that you seek to be persecuted, but when you're persecuted, the implication is happy. Happy when people insult you. Anybody ever been insulted? Did it make you happy? Anybody ever said some stuff that was false about you? Did it make you happy? What is he talking about? Right? What is what happy? I, yeah. So he says this. So two, two, two things I want to give you. Write, write this on your handout. Listen carefully. He says, happy are those who are persecuted. And then he says, for righteousness. Then he says, happy are those who are insulted, persecuted, falsely accused. <clears throat> then he says, on behalf of me. Here's what I need for you to understand. A, A, write this down, write this down. A, on your handout, write it down. Jesus is saying... Persecution is going to happen to everyone. Persecution is going to happen to everyone. No one avoids persecution. 
No one avoids being talked about. No one avoids being insulted. Nobody avoids uh, being falsely accused. Nobody avoids being oppressed. Nobody avoids being slighted. Nobody Nobody avoids that. Everybody's getting some. B, on your handout, write this down. It is better, since it's going to happen anyway, it is better to be persecuted for doing what is right rather than doing what is wrong. Here is the crux of what he's getting at. If you're going to be persecuted, and you are, he says it's better to be persecuted for doing what is right rather than doing what is wrong. If you're persecuted for doing what is wrong, you're not being persecuted. You're getting what you owe, what you're owed. You missed that one. I can't tell you can't. If, if, if you're being persecuted for doing wrong, you're not really being persecuted. You're being paid back. That's called reaping what you sow. Being persecuted is... It, It it really, really pops up when you've done nothing wrong. When you've done what you were supposed to do, listen, and because you did what you were supposed to do, you get talked about. Has anybody, watch this, has anybody ever tried to live your best saved life (laughs) and somebody was mad because you was trying to be right? And they called you names because you were trying to be right. And you were called a fool because you decided to forgive somebody that everybody else thought you shouldn't have forgiven. No? He says, he says, if you're going to be persecuted, it's best, it's best to be persecuted for doing what is right rather than doing what is wrong. Now watch this. And he says, the person who does what, listen carefully, the person who does what is right when persecution comes, Jesus says, is happy. Happy. That's, That's a hard, that's a hard word. Jesus says, the one who is persecuted when they're doing what they should do, that's the person that's happy. It's hard to get y'all to buy that, huh? Listen, if if you will, let let, let, let me kind of be a little historical. Because this is hard to understand and it's hard to see in your immediate right now context. Um, If you leave here and go home with your wife, with your husband, and you do what you're supposed to do, and this is the problem, and many of us have this problem, and you do what you're supposed to do, and you find out that someone cheated on you, or someone is mistreating you, but you're doing what you're supposed to do as a husband or a wife. When you find out, that doesn't make you happy. When, you, when you've been a friend to someone, right? You've given them money. You've loaned them money. You, you, you've, you, you've put yourself out of the way. You, you left your home and picked them up. You let them borrow your car. You, you took days off from work to help meet their needs. You did what you were supposed to do. And then you find out this friend has been talking about you behind your back. Listen to me. That's hard. It's hard to understand happy in that context. Because it's not immediate. What Jesus is getting at, this is not immediate. It's not like, oh, look, I've been betrayed. Woohoo! That, that's not what he's getting at. And see, and you won't get that until, until I walk you through a little bit of a historical piece. Are you ready? Here we go. If you understand the black experience inside of America, think about it. When you understand the black experience inside of America, starting in 1619 in Jamestown, Virginia, when the first slaves arrived on the boat and slavery began for us on this continent, 
we were subjected to some of the most inhumane treatment ever wrought on a people on this planet. Listen to me very, very carefully. Not only was there slavery, forced labor, but behind the slavery, oh my God, not just the forced labor, but there was violence associated with it. Not just physical violence. There was the physical violence. There was the, the there, there, oh my God, there was the mutilating of black bodies for 300 years in this country. There was the lynching, the, the lynchings that took place. There were castrations that took place. Literally, they would bring black men, men in and they would pull their pants down and castrate them in front of other slaves. There was the rape of the women. None of us in here are pure African. Why? Because every one of us have families that go back to a plantation where rape and sodomy happen not just to the women but to the men. It was violence that was physical. It was violence that was emotional. You watched your kids being sold and as a good mother or father you could do nothing. You, the slave master came into the quarters and slept with your wife while you're laying there. And you can do nothing as a man. Then they turn around and call you a boy. You a full grown man. The, listen, the brutality was physical. The brutality was emotional. The brutality was psychological. In a book written by Margaret Butcher called The Negro in American Culture, in 1961, she quotes James Baldwin as saying this, To be a Negro in this country and to be relatively conscious is to be in a rage almost all the time. So that the first problem is how to control that rage so it won't destroy you. And we were subjected, listen, and not only that, even to this day, we're still having conversations about blackface, still having conversations about young men being lynched, about Sandra Bland being killed by police. Are you serious? We're still having issues of black men being picked off, black women being picked off, black boys, black girls being picked off inside of this country and no retribution or justice for anyone. Are you serious? And now the white establishment wants to say, you guys need to stop talking about that racism stuff. Ah. Treat it like property. No dignity as a person. Murdered at will. And in the depths of the darkness that black people have faced in this country uprose the black church. The black church exists for only one reason. Because we were kicked out of the white ones. You missed it. The black church exists for one reason and one reason alone. It exists because we were not allowed to be persons and we were not guaranteed personhood inside of the white church. And once black people began to read and they began to look at the scriptures and read the scriptures and understand the scriptures, they all of a sudden understood that what we had been told about Christianity wasn't the truth. And what we had been told about Jesus was not the truth. Once slaves and former slaves began to read and understand, wait a minute, in Christ there is no Jew, no Gentile, no male, no female, no black, nor white, no. Everybody is equal at the cross. Wait a minute. Something's wrong here. Nat Turner figured it out. 
Others figured it out. And inside of the rising of the black church, whoo, in the midst of all the struggle and the trouble and the issue and the problem and the difficulty, we began to create songs that resonated from the inner dwelling of who we were as a people. And they were called spirituals. And some of these slave spirituals, we, listen, we would, we would have, we, we would be in the midst of trouble and a slave would break out and begin to sing, I'm so glad that trouble don't last always. In the, in the, uh, listen, in the dross of the difficulty of just existing as a human being in this country. Going to sleep, worried about my children. Going to sleep, worried about my wife. Going to sleep, worried about my own health and worried about my freedom. And going to sleep with all of the cares of the world on our heads. We still woke up in the morning saying, when I woke up this morning, my mind was stayed on Jesus. In the middle of the turmoil of what we face, some slave somewhere on some plantation penned these words. Why should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart be lonely and long for heavenly home? My constant, listen, my con Jesus, my constant friend is he. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. Now, that's not the exciting part. The exciting part is the chorus that comes right after. Because a slave said, I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. How in the world can you sing about happiness and sing about freedom when you're hurting as a slave? Whew. Because the black church is this last beatitude personified. And you don't see it when you're going through it. You see it as you go through it. You don't get happy immediately, but when you watch God keep you from going crazy in the middle of what would have made you crazy, all of a sudden you discover and appreciate who God is and the power that he has and the ability to hold you and the ability to keep you and the ability to make a way out of no. It is in the middle of the struggle. A slave said, I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. Oh my God. The black church is this beatitude personified. There are some of you in here, your life isn't the way you want it. But in the middle of going through the hurt and the pain, you have learned some stuff about God that if it never gets to the way you want it, you're going to be okay. Because you know God, oh my God, God has not, even if God doesn't change your situation, God has changed your perspective. And so when you praise and you lift hands and you shout and you cry and you stomp, listen, quit trying to calm people down. You don't know where they've been. You don't know where they've come from. You don't know. You don't know. There are some people in this room today, listen, who never thought they would ever get their head out of the... Listen, there are some people in this place who have been so far down, they had to look up to see down. And they've learned in the middle of it, God has kept them. 
and hell is going on on the outside, but we can come into church and shout and smile and have a good time if only for a few minutes because of the greatness and the mercy and the kindness and the power of the almighty God whom we serve. And so you don't see it or you don't feel it immediately, but you sense it as God walks you through it slowly. That's why you got to be careful about self-medicating because you, you will, listen, when you self-medicate, here's what you do. Here's what you do when you self-medicate. Here's what you do. You exchange the peace of, listen, of God for the peace of the substance. Ah, you missed that one. You exchange the peace of God for the peace of the substance. And you will spend more money trying to be happy. You will spend more time trying to be happy. You will waste your life and health trying to be happy. When God simply says, happy are people who decide to do right. And when the troubles come, when you decide to do right, you will not have to beat yourself up and think, well, maybe I should have or if, because that's what some of us do. We beat ourselves up and we say, well, if I wouldn't have done this, then this, I'm here to tell you, you could, Jesus never sinned and hell still came his way. But when you haven't done, when you've only done what God wanted you to do and you still get persecuted, here's what you can count on. What God allows in your life, God, listen to me, through the storm of it, he will provide what you need. Now, if you signed up for it, you might have to pay for it. But if you do what God says do, live how God says live, and things still come in as they will, you, listen to me, you don't have to pay for it. God will provide for you. Some of you have experienced that already. Some of you have lived lives where you did what you were supposed to do and you got the short end of the stick. But I guarantee you, testimony after testimony after testimony after testimony, people who did what they were supposed to do and got the short end of the stick, oftentimes what God will do is on the other side, God will counterbalance that thing with some blessings that nobody pays attention to, that nobody sees, and if we're not careful, we will overlook this side. And he says, happy, happy are those who are persecuted because of me. Father in heaven, I thank you. God, I bless your name. God, I ask that you would please speak to our hearts and our minds today. I'm asking, Lord, that you would open us up in a way that you've never opened us up before, in a way we've never been open, to hear what you want to say, what you're trying to say, what you have said. Lord, as the words swirl around in our head, I'm, op I'm asking, Lord, that you would open our minds in such a way that the words will find a home deep in our souls. And that we will begin to acquire all of the attitudes that we have talked about so that we might move into happy. And this last one, God, I know this one is difficult. But we have the testimony of our ancestors to tell us. In the middle of trouble, 
I can sing because I'm happy. I can sing because I'm free. May not be free physically, but I can show be free mentally and spiritually. And so, Father, I'm asking every person in this room, right where we are, that you would visit us where we sit or stand. That you would speak to our hearts, that you would speak to our minds. That you would teach us. That we would move forward walking out of this place with our heads up. Because we stand on, some of us in this room, we have no idea how happy our parents and foreparents and grand, great grandparents are because we exist. Yes. We are the answer to somebody else's prayer. And for that, I change our perspective so we can be happy. It's in the mighty and wonderful name of Jesus. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're here today and you've never surrendered your life to Christ, if you've never given your life to him, I'm here to tell you, to do that would be the best decision you could ever make in your life. Will it make you rich? Maybe, maybe not. Will it remove all of your problems? Probably not. But surrendering to Christ has the ability to give you peace that passes understanding. Happiness that exudes out of you that nobody could put out. It has the ability to give you the peace of spirit knowing that your home is safe with God. And if you've never surrendered your life to him, not sure what you're waiting on, but he's here. He's here. And he stands. And he says, come. If you're here and you've surrendered your life to him at a particular point in time, but you just kind of went off and did your own thing and kind of got lost out there and was finding it a little bit difficult to make your way home, God says, hey, 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 turn around, walk back. I'm still here. God says, I haven't given up on you. I haven't forgotten about you. The reason why I brought you here today is so you can hear what's being said at this moment. So if you have walked away from him, God invites you to come home. Perhaps you're here and you need a, a church home. You've been looking, you've been searching, and you walked in and you said, man, I like this. This is, you know, this is comfortable. Well, that's what home feels like. So welcome home. Maybe at the end of service, you need someone to pray with you about something going on in your life. Listen, we'll stand with you. We'll pray for you. We'll pray with you. And so if one of those categories fits you, when we dismiss, I invite you to meet us up here at this altar. We're not going to make a spectacle out of you. We simply want to help you get what you need from God today. And so we thank you. Our Father, we love you, our Father, for doing what only you can do at this moment. Touch, heal, deliver, and set free. Everybody standing. Everybody standing. Turn to your neighbor, look him in the eye, grab him by the hand, give him a big smile. And tell him, neighbor, may the Lord bless you. May he keep you and cause his face to shine on you. And neighbor, and neighbor, be a peacemaker. Be a peacemaker. Neighbor, neighbor, do what you're supposed to do. So when bad things happen, you don't have to blame yourself and you don't have to pay for it on your own. Neighbor, I love you. And I really mean that today. 
And I just want to say to you, neighbor, get out of here. Go be happy and make somebody else happy. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. Love you guys. See you next week. See you next week. Love you.